Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. Mike Pompeo, who has been considered to be actively planning to run for president in 2024, announced his latest decision over the weekend. While Pompeo did not explicitly endorse President Trump, he did say that he would fully support the winner of the Republican primary. For now, this appears to be President Trump. Jim Jordan, who is a loyal supporter of President Trump, once again expressed his 100% support for President Trump, even though the other candidates are his good friends. The select subcommittee on the coronavirus pandemic has exposed evidence that Chinese Communist Party officials tried to interfere with the congressional investigation into the source of the COVID-19 virus. The highly sought after investment icon Warren Buffett recently commented on Bitcoin and he also commented on the economic situation in the US. Twitter defined Canada CBC as a government funded media outlet. This label will obviously allow readers to make better judgments about the information they read. French President Macron signed a pension reform bill despite popular opposition. This has cost him politically, but it has not yet been shown just how big this cost will be. Okay, let's get into it. There's been speculation that in addition to President Trump, former Vice President Mike Pence and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo are interested in running for the 2024 presidency, but Mike Pompeo broke the speculation on Friday. He said that he would not run for the presidency in 2024. Pompeo tweeted, he made this decision after consulting with his wife. The tweet said, Susan and I have concluded after much consideration and prayer that I will not present myself as a candidate to become president of the United States in the 2024 election. Pompeo denied that President Trump's re-election in 2024 influenced his decision. He said that he decided to support the eventual Republican presidential nominee. This decision is deeply personal and ultimately we decided that the time is just not right. But Pompeo did not rule out the possibility of running for president in the future. To those of you this announcement disappoints, my apologies. And to those of you at Thrills know that I'm only 59, there remain many more opportunities for which the timing might be more fitting as presidential leadership becomes even more necessary. After retiring from the Trump administration, Pompeo has published a memoir and he attended many public events, but in recent times he has largely disappeared from the public eye. He has avoided visiting early primary states as some candidates and potential contenders have begun to wade into the race. He recently visited Ukraine, but he didn't visit Iowa. At the annual conference of the National Rifle Association, Representative Jim Jordan stated his unequivocal support for President Trump. Jordan said, I'm 100% for President Trump. He praised President Trump for keeping his campaign promises and for working hard to achieve his goals, no matter how much resistance there was. Jordan also said, no one has demonstrated that they will do what they said and get things done like he did, and he did it with everyone in that town against him. And that's what I still respect about President Trump, and I'm for him all the way. Jordan expressed his kindness to the other candidates. He said, I like all of them. I'm friends with them. I just talked to Vice President Pence, great guy. Governor DeSantis, a great guy. When we formed the Freedom Caucus, there were nine of us. He was one of them. Former Vice President Pence also attended the annual conference of the National Rifle Association. This was the first time since he left office that he and President Trump attended the same event at the same time. Jordan supports President Trump because President Trump can best protect the Second Amendment rights of Americans. Jordan said, why I support President Trump so strongly is because you got to have people who respect the Second Amendment, who respect the First Amendment, and who respect the Constitution. In Jordan's view, Second Amendment rights are the cornerstone of democracy. Jordan also said, I always tell folks the Second Amendment is right next to the first for a reason. It's darn important. And we need to understand that and not let the left continue to chip away because ultimately they want to get rid of it. Jordan believes that the Second Amendment cannot be compromised. Jordan added, you can't meet the Democrats in the middle because we just fundamentally disagree. Our Constitution fundamentally disagrees with where they want to go. Recently, there have been a bunch of gun crimes. This is the reason that the far left is using to clamor for a gun ban. But Jordan says that the banning of guns won't solve the problem. 
Referring to recent mass shootings in Kentucky and Tennessee, Jordan said, I think people with common sense and logic understand that these tragedies are terrible. We wish they never happened. But the answer is not to take firearms away from law-abiding American citizens. According to economist, researcher, and author John Lott, two of the most popular gun control proposals have little or no effect on gun crime and they actually exacerbate the problem for the people that they're supposed to protect. According to statistics from the CPRC, 94% of mass shootings since 1950 have occurred in gun-free zones. President Trump's popularity has risen rather than fallen since his indictment and his campaign coffers have totaled more than $34 million, which is far more than any of his competitors. According to the Trump campaign's recent released campaign finance report, the Trump campaign raised more than $18 million in the first three months of the year with $4 million of contributions received within 24 hours of the indictment. Although former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley and former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, who are two Republican politicians, have also announced their candidacy and have open campaign fundraisers, President Trump is still far ahead in the early polls. And his lead in the Republican Party remains significant in terms of campaign funding and polling support. On Saturday, April 15th, the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic of the House of Representatives said on its official Twitter account that officials from the Chinese Communist Embassy in the U.S. were trying to interfere with the lawmakers' investigation into the origins of COVID-19. The CCP has tried to silence them. According to a congressional announcement, this Tuesday's hearing will be the second hearing to investigate the source of COVID-19. It's titled... China's complicity in the COVID-19. It will examine the unconventional behavior of the CCP in the COVID-19 crisis and it will hold the CCP accountable for it. Li Xiong, who is a counselor in the Congressional and Local Affairs section of the Chinese Embassy in the United States, emailed members of Congress expressing grave concerns about the COVID-19 origin hearings being held in Congress on Tuesday. The subcommittee posted the letter on Twitter and replied that it won't work. We will follow the facts wherever they lead and we will deliver the truth to Americans. At the initial hearing, expert witnesses revealed new evidence that COVID-19 may have originated in a laboratory leak in Wuhan. However, both Republican and Democrat members of the House acknowledge that the answer to the question of COVID-19's origin is still unclear. What the Chinese Communist Party did was so stupid that it was as if the judge was looking for evidence and the suspect was actively presenting it. At the hearing on the 18th, former Director of National Intelligence John Radcliffe and Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, David Feith, will both testify. Before we move on to Twitter labeling the CBC as government-funded media and a Warren Buffett blasting Bitcoin and warning that more banks are going to fall, I want to remind you of our recent video on our website. Over the weekend, we published a video about a true story regarding how cryptocurrency mining froze an entire city, leaving people without electricity and heat in minus 30 degrees Celsius weather for more than a week. I'll leave the link in the description below, and here's the trailer. In late November last year, the small town of Ekaibestis in northern Kazakhstan was plunged into chaos. Several areas were left without heat for more than a week in temperatures of minus 30 degrees Celsius. Residents had to build fires in the yards to keep warm. Water sewage pipes froze, causing people who were living in high-rise buildings to lose their drinking water, and they were unable to use the toilets. The power outage lasted until December, and even after the power was restored, at least 17 apartment buildings remained without heat. So why did these residents have to experience such a cold winter? This was because the city they live in was frozen by Bitcoin. This is not a dystopian plot in a movie, it's a real thing that happened. We'll go into more details on our membership site at frontpageshow.com. I hope to see you there. 
Twitter labeled the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC, as a government-funded media on April 16th. The national broadcaster received $1.2 billion in funding from the federal government in 2021 to 2022. CBC's response, of course, was to reject Twitter's tag. CBC's director of media relations, Leon Marr, told the Epoch Times in an email that Twitter's own policy defines government-funded media as cases where the government may have varying degrees of government involvement over editorial content, which is clearly not the case with CBC Radio Canada. But Canada's Conservative leader, Pierre Polyev, who has often sparred with the CBC and who has demanded it stop accepting federal funds, welcomed the April 16th label. Polyev wrote on Twitter, CBC officially exposed as government-funded media. Now people know it is Trudeau propaganda, not news. Warren Buffett, who is known as a legend of Wall Street stocks, was interviewed by CNBC recently. In response to the current economic situation, Buffett blasted Bitcoin and some banks for their faulty strategies, and he warned that inflation and recession could hurt investors and could cause serious problems. Buffett says Bitcoin has no intrinsic value at all and is a gambling token. But... That won't stop human nature from gambling, he says. And only winners make a big deal out of it. If you lose, you lose your entire fortune. He himself, on the other hand, enjoys getting rich slowly. In the face of today's difficult environment, Warren Buffett said, frankly, for the country, inflation is a continuing threat. The United States so far has handled it very well, but he warned that inflation and recession will impact investors and it will cause big trouble. He also warned the U.S. government not to overspend. This may help politicians electorally, but it only leaves the problem to future generations. Buffett said that fiscal policy scares him more than monetary policy. In response to the raging banking crisis, Warren Buffett criticized some bank executives for doing stupid things and for poor asset liability management. He said that it would happen again one day and that the most important thing for banks is to maintain public confidence in them. Buffett expects those distressed companies to go out of business one after another in the coming weeks or months as the general environment continues to be tough. On this issue, Bob Nardelli, the former CEO of Home Depot, also shares Buffett's views. Nardelli said in an April 14th interview with Fox, I think we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies, like Bed Bath & Beyond. We got Walmart not only laying off people, but closing stores. We got Accenture laying off people. We got Amazon closing distribution centers. So I think there's a tremendous mixed message. He said that the current complexity of the U.S. economy is unlike anything he has seen in 52 years. He also said, I think we're in a very complex environment. And of course, this debt issue only adds to that. It adds to the certainty of uncertainty of what's going to happen. Bankruptcy filings across the United States rose for the third straight month in March in all major industries, according to Epic Bankruptcy, which is a provider of data, technology, and services to the U.S. Bankruptcy Court. Last month, new bankruptcy filings increased 17% over March of 2022 filings. This is the highest monthly number of bankruptcy filings since April of 2021. First quarter corporate bankruptcy filings came in at 183. S&P Global said that this is more than any comparable period in the past 12 years. French President Emmanuel Macron signed the controversial pension reform bill into law early on Saturday morning despite riots breaking out in Paris and beyond. Protesters had been hoping that the Constitutional Court would strike down the legislation or it would force a referendum on it. Many believe that the nature of the bill violates the French Constitution. The French Constitutional Council functions similar to the U.S. Supreme Court. Although the court rejected some provisions, the nine judges finally approved the plan to gradually raise the retirement age from 62 to 64 after seven hours of debate. In France, the pension system is considered the cornerstone of the social security system. And the right to receive a full pension at the age of 62 is highly valued. 
age change is always a sensitive issue. The French public responded to the news with spontaneous protests. Some of the protests reportedly devolved into rioting. Many protesters gathered outside Paris City Hall holding protest signs, and some burned garbage during the Paris March, causing several fires. Paris police said that 112 people were arrested. French law enforcement agencies also faced criticism on Saturday morning as officers tried to blind journalists with high-powered flashlights. Polls show that the vast majority of the population rejects the reform plan. Sophie Benet, the leader of the French General Federation of Trade Unions, the CGT, said, all the unions call on the president to show wisdom, to listen and understand what is happening in the country and not to promulgate this law. The organization claimed that pulling the legislation would be the only way for the government to calm the anger in France. The CGT also called for a historic protest to be held on May 1st. Benet said the lives of French men and women do not depend on the opinion of nine people. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double check to make sure that you are still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.